Good morning. Um, today I want to talk about uh, visual creativity and what it can teach us about our own incredible brains. Take a look at this painting. What is it about da Vinci's masterful brushstrokes that evokes a living, breathing, three-dimensional object in our minds? How about this painting, which, despite its very different and perhaps unusual style, still looks kind of real? Or this one? Or even this one by three-year-old Teresa? It still looks like a face, right? How does that work? Now, we humans, we've been using physical tools like brushes and chisels to reconstruct our sensory observations in the form of paintings and sculptures for at least 60,000 years. This incredible cave painting, for instance, is thought to be 17,000 years old. That's thousands of years before we had uh, domesticated sheep and goats even. In fact, we've been doing this um, abstracting away from observations and creating them in the form of paintings for so long that it's thought to be well before the earliest signs of uh, any meaningful written language even. Take a look at this uh, cave painting where the artist depicts this battle scene using a few brushstrokes, no more than say 10 or 20. Now, many people believe that it is precisely this ability to abstract away from reality and to conceptualize that reality that underpins the cognitive abilities that make us uniquely intelligent as human beings. But it largely remains a mystery how exactly we do this. Um, and the field of artificial intelligence, or AI, um, concerns itself with this question. Basically, what is intelligence? What is it composed of? How does it come to be, and how can we recreate it? I'm an AI scientist myself, and I've spent most of my career thinking about how visual conceptualization and visual abstraction can be recreated. Now, as you know and as you heard, AI has been making great progress over the past couple of decades. We now have computer programs that can play chess or Go as well as the best humans, and even self-driving cars seem within reach. What I'm going to talk about today is some of the early steps we've taken uh, towards getting computers to be visually creative as well. Now, to do this, we use computers heavily. Um, and I'd like to begin by going over what a computer actually is. So a computer, in my mind, is a simple device that transforms inputs to outputs. Um, and the way we program a computer is by giving it a list of instructions or an algorithm to specify how we want those inputs to be transformed into outputs. In this example, um, the inputs are two numbers. And what we want the computer to do is to output the sum. And the algorithm that's run on the computer is the summation algorithm. Now, what makes computers really useful is that they are extremely fast and they are extremely accurate. So they do those instructions very, very quickly and very accurately. But it turns out that there are certain input-output transformations um, or certain tasks that we really care about, but no computer scientist has succeeded in writing an algorithm for it from scratch and only from their own minds. For instance, uh, consider the case of translation, um, where you want to go from one language to another language. Now, of course, there are many human beings that know these two languages and can translate, but none of them would be able to describe how they do it with sufficient formality uh, to be able to express it to a computer. And that's where the idea of learning comes in. You will have heard of the term machine learning, where the idea is that if we give the computer enough examples of sentences in both languages, it will by itself learn how to do this transformation. And indeed, today, we now have systems that can classify pictures of cats and dogs and translate sentences from languages into each other with fairly good accuracy. Now, the question that I asked um, with my colleagues a couple of years ago was, could we use this paradigm to get computers to be creative? So if I consider the paintbrush and paint to be inputs to a computer, can I get it to output 
visually interesting, conceptually abstract outputs at the other end. Now, we know that computers can be used to create images. That's what digital art is all about. But in normal digital art, the human is specifying exactly what they want the computer to do. The algorithm is actually being provided by the human. The question here is, can the computer learn that algorithm by itself through trial and error? Can it figure out what kinds of images are visually appealing and conceptually abstract? So I'm going to dive into the setup that we actually used. Um, let's begin with a painter in the bottom right. So the painter is a computer program that sends actions to another computer program um, in the form of brush strokes. This second thing, which I call the canvas here, think of it as something like Adobe Photoshop or Microsoft Paint. It's a simulated painting environment. The painter's job is to produce an image that looks as real as possible. The final state of this painting environment is sent as an image to another computer program in the top, which I call the critic. The critic's job is to determine how real that image looks and to express it in the form of a reward, which is sent back to the painter. The reward is a single number that expresses how real the critic thinks that image looks. And this cycle is repeated millions or billions of times until the painter gets really good at producing images and the critic gets good at determining what looks real and what looks fake. And this process is called adversarial reinforcement learning and is powered by machine learning. That's how the critic and the painter update themselves over time. More concretely, the two computer programs are implemented by what we call neural networks. So in each one of these sections, I've shown the neural network corresponding to the painter and the neural network corresponding to the critic. A neural network is basically a tunable mathematical function that transforms inputs to desirable outputs. And it updates itself slightly over time to do better, better uh, mappings of this kind. So the painter network takes a partially complete image as input, and it outputs the actions that it wants the environment to execute next. And the critic network, as I said, takes a complete image as input in the bottom, and it outputs a single number which expresses how real or fake the image looks. And the action that the painter sends is a single brush stroke. So this specifies how thick the brush stroke is, how much pressure is applied, what color it is, and where it starts and where it ends. And by producing a sequence of these actions, it produces a complete image. Now, if you train this well enough and for long enough, uh, you can end up with uh, computer programs that produce relatively good-looking images. So here, we've trained the program to reconstruct the image on the left. And you can see that it's using this real robotic arm and a real paintbrush with real ink uh, to create reconstructions of that image. That's not too bad, right? Now, naturally, we wanted to see whether we could scale this idea up even further. So we collected a data set of images of human faces, and um, we asked the neural painter to produce images that look like these photographs. So all the computer is given is some virtual paint, it's given a fixed amount of time, and it's given these photographs, and it's asked to create something that looks like them. Now keep in mind, we never show the computer how a human would draw a portrait, and we never tell the computer how humans judge between real and fake looking portraits. All it's given is the, the opportunity to try, and it's given images that look real. And this is what it produces at the end of that training process. So I'll give you a few minutes to just observe what it's doing. You'll notice that it starts off with relatively simple shapes just to convey the approximate contours of a face. But it manages to use this brush quite accurately to gradually fix over the mistakes it makes early on and to eventually end up with an image that looks kind of real. 
and the physical properties of the brush are such that the final image actually kind of resembles the kinds of portraits we would create if we were given just as much time. Here's another example of a portrait painted by this painter. So you'll see that it produces a variety of images um, and that it can vary the pose of the person being painted uh, and that, as I said, it can control the brush with sufficient accuracy to create a variety of shapes and textures. Now, in this example, the computer is generating the image entirely from its own imagination, so to speak, which means that we're not asking it to reconstruct a certain painting. We're just saying, give us an image that looks real to you, any image that you want. And here's another example of an image produced by this model. Now, we were all very excited by these results, but what I really wanted to know was, instead of giving the computer hundreds of brush strokes to create the image, what if we limited it to only 10 or 20 brush strokes? Could it learn to be visually abstract? Could it learn to conceptualize what it means for something to look like a face? Could it be creative, in other words? And so that's what we did. We retrained the painter and the critic, but this time we only allowed it 10 or 20 interactions with the environment. And then this is the kind of portrait it painted for us. I was super excited when I saw this result for the first time. You'll see that the painter uses very succinct brush strokes to depict the eyes of the face. It uses a single brush stroke to depict the red lips. And look at the way it draws the contours of the face. It's actually quite reminiscent of how I would draw a face if I were asked to do so. You might even notice why it draws that um, red, red line in the third panel. But if you pay attention, you'll see that that red line eventually becomes the cheek in the faces, uh, the, the blush in the piece, uh, face's cheeks at the end. This is pretty remarkable. And it shows the agent's ability to kind of make long-term plans. And here are some more of the painter's images. Notice the Picasso-esque image in the top left or the really super simple minimal image in the bottom right. One of my favorites is this one in the left where it literally uses just a single dot for each one of the face's eyes. Remember, none of this has ever been in the data given to the painter during training. All of this not because we made the networks bigger or gave it more data, but because we gave it a set of tools, namely paintbrushes, and we get it, gave it an environment, and we gave it a fixed amount of time, and we asked it to do the best job that it can. Now, an interesting question to consider is whether this computer program is creative. It certainly produces interesting-looking images. Um, I would say that some of them are even aesthetically pleasing. I'd be happy to have them on my own walls. And it can produce an infinite variety of them. So you can ask it to continuously paint paintings and it'll produce more and more images of this kind. But is this what we mean by creativity? Um, is this what we mean when we say a, an artist is being creative? Now, regardless of your answer to that question, I think these demonstrations are important because they shed light on the cognitive capabilities that are actually important for our own creativity. So what, re what is a human artist doing when they're painting a painting? What objective function are, are they optimizing for? A chess player who's playing chess, what's going on in their mind? Or a driver when driving, what's going on in their mind? And what I find most exciting is when AI can discover solutions that were previously hidden in plain sight. So for instance, many of you will have heard of AlphaGo, which was this um, state-of-the-art Go-playing uh, neural network, and how in a fabled Move 37, it discovered a Go move that has literally transformed the way we humans play Go now. Now, this back and forth between human and machine um, is tremendously powerful, in my opinion. And we're beginning to see this even in the arts. So on this slide, I'm showing the works of a number of painters and artists who use AI in their day-to-day -day work to create pieces that previously would not have been able to um, be created. 
And I'm very much looking forward to seeing how more of these innovations will continue to create human AI co-creations of new kinds. Thank you.